If you would uh, remain standing and once again turn um, your Bible to Genesis 42 and we will read uh, the second part of our reading from this chapter starting from verse 18 to uh, 38. Hear the word of the living God. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live. For I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody. And let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households. And bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they say to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. In that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack. And to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his uh, donkey father at, at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this their hearts failed them and they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this? that God has done to us. When they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we say to him, We are honest men. We have never been spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our, our father. One is no more and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your households, and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me, then I shall know that you are not spies, but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they, when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have breathed me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you will take Benjamin? All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he's the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring, da you would da bring down my gray hairs with sorrow. To Sheol. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we now look into your word, the story of your servant Joseph, we pray that you would give us hearts that will, would obey your word, your voice from heaven through the preaching of your word, and eyes that would see the mystery of your word through the proclamation of your word and lives that will 
take all these things in, to, to the heart and apply them in the Christian life. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. In uh, Genesis 42, the chapter that we are considering tonight, we see the famine in Egypt being extended or expanded to Canaan. The land of Canaan was hit by the famine. And I want us to ask one question tonight, very important question. Why do you think God, by his providential rule, allowed the famine to hit Canaan? From anyone who knows the history of God's redemptive plan, I would ex expect answers like, God allowed the famine in Egypt to hit uh, the land of Canaan in order to use famine as a way to reunite Joseph with his brothers. And the second answer would be for God to use Joseph to gather the uh, covenant people to worship him in the land of Egypt and return back to their homeland and continue worshiping God. Now, I would tell you that both answers would be right. Both, both answers would be correct. But according to chapter 42, the first purpose or the first step in fulfilling uh, the bigger plan of God, the first step that God does in that process is somewhat different from the two answers that I just mentioned to all of you. The first step was to, in, to evoke or awake the sleeping conscience, conscience of Joseph's brothers. The lesson tonight is this. God uses severity and grace to awaken his people's conscience and bring them to repentance. That's exactly what we see in Genesis uh, 42. And by God's grace, we will discover uh, that under three subheadings tonight. First, I want us to consider the sleeping conscience of Joseph's brothers. Their conscience were lingering. They were far away from recognizing their guilty for 20 years. So first I want us to see that. And secondly, Joseph awakening the conscience of his brothers. God using Joseph to actually call his own brothers to repentance. And thirdly, Joseph's unconditional love to his brothers, like Christ's love. So the sleeping conscience of Joseph's brothers. Now, if you go back to chapter 41, at the end of the chapter, you will clearly see God preparing Joseph for the ministry of repentance, for the ministry of reconciliation with his own brothers. Why did, Joseph, uh, why did Pharaoh exalt Joseph? Why did God control the heart of Pharaoh in Egypt to exalt this humble uh, Jew, humble uh, servant of God from Israel? It was for this purpose. Pharaoh exalted him by God's providence to prepare him to represent Christ, to picture to us the ministry of Christ in repentance of his children. Jacob learned 
once the famine hit um, Canaan, uh, Jacob learned about the availability of grain in Egypt. Verses 1 and 2 brings that, that to light. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. Now, I want you to notice that uh, the moment Jacob started mentioning Egypt to his sons, the moment, the moment Jacob told them, I learned that grain is available in Egypt, and you, my sons, should go to Egypt. They were in distress. They were afraid. You see, the father asked them, why are you looking at one another? The moment they heard Egypt, it was as if someone said to them, there is a ghost in, in the room. You know, for the past 20 years, the two names that they scared about were Joseph and Egypt. For 20 years, they were suppressing their conscience. They were running from facing their guilt. And it took them 20 years to conceal their sin, to convince themselves that Joseph was dead. Their lingering guilt has been suppressing their conscience. How many of you are familiar with uh, the old advice, let your conscience be your guide? Now let me ask you this, is it completely right? Is it totally right to believe in that as a Christian? Is your conscience the ultimate or final guide of your Christian life? Yes, conscience is a wonderful gift from God. But remember, conscience is not infallible. Conscience is not like the Holy Spirit. Conscience doesn't compel you to see your sin and repent. Conscience can, uh, can uh, get you out of trouble, but conscience is not going to uh, remove sin from your life or bring you to repentance. All of us, you see, in our life, we have uh, we have uh, suppressed our conscience. We have violated our conscience and committed sin against our own conscience. In order to suppress their conscience, Joseph's brothers, for 20 years, they have been telling themselves, Joseph is dead. And because Joseph is dead, we're not going to face our guilty you know what they were telling their own life? As time goes by, the passage of days, months, and years will remove away our sin. Listen, the passage of time will never remove your sin. The only way for the removal of sin is repentance. Even if, take, if it takes 20 years, 40 years, passage of years will not replace the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ and cover, and cover your sin. You must repent. The only way to arrive to restoration is repentance. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Blessed is who? The man 
whose sin has been forgiven. Blessed means what? Happy. The only person who can be, um, who can be glad and who can, who can rejoice in the presence of God is the one whose sin has been forgiven. If you are lingering uh, with your sin and, and you are refusing to, uh, to repent of your sin, then joy will not part of your Christian life. There will not be gladness, true joy, true gladness in your life. That was what's happening in the life of Joseph's brothers. Psalm 119, verse 67. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. You see, that's the reason why I told you God uses severity or hardship, difficult times to humble his children. To bring them to repentance, to awaken their conscience. And the psalmist said, before I was afflicted, no affliction, everything was okay. And then I went astray from you. I sinned against you. But now, because I'm afflicted, because I'm under difficult circumstances in my life, but now I keep your word. Because I'm afflicted now, I keep your word. I see myself now. The affliction, the trials in my life showed me the condition of my spiritual life. And now I love your word. I, I repented and I love your word. Do you remember what the writer of the Hebrews uh, said about our conscience in Hebrews 9.14? The blood of Jesus Christ through the eternal spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, cleansed. Our conscience. So Joseph's brothers needed deliverance from their guilt, from their sin. They had to repent. They had to come to the point where they will say, we are guilty against our brother and against God. And that brings us to my second point. To the person, the very person whom God uses now to call them to repentance. And the person was Joseph, their own brother. And notice verse uh, 6 to, um, to 11. Now Joseph was governor over the land, governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all uh, the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Now I will stop there. Because I want us to see the bowing down of his brothers. The bowing down before Joseph was the fulfillment of the dream, the two dreams that he saw when he was 17 years old. You remember what happened? He came to them and he told his brothers, I, you know, I, I dreamed, God showed me uh, these two dreams, and, and you, my brothers, including my father, you all will bow down before me. And uh, they hated him. Not only they hated him, but also what? They uh, decided to kill him, and then by God's providence, they sold him to Egypt. But I want you to recognize one thing in relation to their bowing down, bowing down before their brother now. With what they did to Joseph, trying to kill him and then finally selling him to Egypt, do you know they were acting not against Joseph's dream, but they were acting against the will of God? They were not sinning only against their brother, but they were sinning against the God of the dream, the God of the redemptive plan for his people. And now God has brought them to the point where they will realize that they were not only sinning against Joseph, but their sin was against God. Remember, every time you sin against your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ, you sin against God. 
Your sin is not horizont only horizontal, but it's also vertical. You sin against God and you sin against your brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, they hated God's plan and they acted against that plan. Lesson number one. Brothers and sisters, you, you can't defeat God's plan. You can't defeat God's plan. Remember Job. At the end of the book of Job, Job said, no one can alter your plan. I have heard about you in the past, not, but now my eyes see that truth. And I despise myself and repent before you, um, the almighty God. He saw his sin and his failure. And he said to God, you are sovereign and no one can alter or prevent your plan. So don't fight against God. Don't be stubborn before God. Repent. You can't defeat God. You can't defeat God's plan. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain what? Will obtain mercy. That's the way. That's the way to go. Now you might ask, God used Joseph to call his uh, brothers to repentance, to show them their sin. And the second thing that we see in relation to the bowing, God used Joseph to call the brothers to repentance. And I, I want you to notice uh, 7 to 10, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them, and he said to them, you are spies, you have come to see the nakedness of the land. They say to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. Now, he treated them like strangers. He spoke to them roughly. What's going on? Is Jesus representing the ministry of Jesus Christ? Think about it. Is he picturing Christ for us? Speaking to his brothers roughly? Treating them like strangers? Why is he doing that? An, an immediate, immediate uh, revelation of himself would solve all the problems. I'm Joseph, I forgive you, so let's move on. I, I, I want to show you what he didn't do and why he didn't do them. First, when they were bowing before him, Joseph didn't say, oh, the time has come. Revenge. Take, take them to the prison and kill them. That was not an option for Joseph. Do you sometimes feel that way? Oh, I wish that person or that, you know, that woman or that man would be under my uh, complete control. I would destroy him. Revenge. That was, not, that was not an option for Joseph. That was not the principle of Joseph as a believer. Revenge was not an option for him. And then he didn't say, you know what? I recognize you, I'm your brother Joseph, and I don't want to see you, I don't have to do anything with you, um, go away from me. In fact, I want you to get out of Egypt right away before I kill you. He, he, didn't, he didn't do that. 
And then the other thing that he didn't do was, he didn't say, hey, I'm Joseph. If it was not from you, I wouldn't be the prime minister of Egypt. So let's forget the past and enjoy life together and take whatever amount of grain you need uh, for you and my father. We're at peace. He didn't do that. Why? Because they had to repent. They had to be restored through repentance. And you might ask, does God forgive people who have not repented? And the answer is no. The biblical pattern is first repentance and then forgiveness. Now, my friends, let me remind you, it doesn't matter how many years we take. If the person doesn't repent, he will not be forgiven by God. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. If they return. 1 John 1, 8, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins if we repent our sin. You see, Joseph's motive to treat his brothers as strangers was not out of hatred. In fact, secretly, you see, he was doing good for them. They opened their sacks and they found their money, their money there. He didn't take their money. He was, he was showing his love to them, but he was doing it secretly without them knowing what was happening, what Joseph was doing, because his duty at that moment, at that period of time, was to call them to repentance. Like the heart of God. You see, God sometimes, even though he's our heavenly father, he chastises us. He disciplines us. He calls us to grow, uh, to go through hard times in order to uh, bring us to repentance. Why was Joseph doing that? Because, you see, they were not repenting. Isn't isn't amazing, you know, for these brothers to stand before Joseph and 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 tell Joseph or say to Joseph, "We are honest men." Wow, we are honest men. We didn't sell you to Egypt. We didn't try to kill you. Of course, they didn't know that it was Joseph. But that's exactly what they were saying. We are honest people. When I was preparing this sermon last week, I arrived to that point and, and I can, you know, I picture Joseph turning back and laughing. When they said, we're honest men. They were not repenting, you see. They were lingering with their sin. Not only that, you see, remember what they told him. This is heartbreaking. They told him, we are the sons of one man, and our youngest is with our father, and the other one, huh, is dead. You see, 20 years, they were telling themselves, Joseph is dead. He is not alive that's exactly what the unbelievers do all the time. Jesus is not alive. God is dead. They even publish a book and give it a title, God is dead. You know what they're, why, why they do that? Because they don't want to repent. They don't want to face their sin, their guilt. So, they tell themselves, no, 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 God doesn't exist. He's dead. Christ is not alive. He was pretending as if he died on the cross. He is not alive. No one is going to hold us responsible for our sins. God is dead. So the reason why they publish books and they produce movies about God being dead is 
because they don't want to repent. The fact was, you see, even though they were telling themselves Joseph is dead, even though unbelievers tell themselves God is dead, it's not true. Joseph was alive and Jesus is alive. Praise be to God. Our God is not dead. And he will hold sinners, rebellious sinners, responsible for their sin. Unless they repent. My prayer, my friends, is, is that you are not there. You are not in that place. Because you don't want to repent, my prayer and my hope uh, for all of you is you are not trying to convince yourself that God is not alive. Christ is not alive. Joseph was alive. Then Joseph Huh, arrested them. You see, they were refusing to repent. So Joseph changed his mind and he arrested them in verse 17. And then on the third day, Joseph changed his mind and he kept Simeon with him and sent them back to Canaan. Then, you see, comes the acknowledgement of their sin. Listen to Verse uh, 21. Then, he t um, then they say to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us. That is why this answered them. Listen, so now. There comes a reckoning for his blood. See? You see, now their eyes were opened. Like the prodigal son. Now they are saying, we're guilty against our brother, against Joseph. Now their conscience pierced them. One theologian said, a life of repentance is a manifestation of an authentic conversion. These brothers were in the covenant, but they were rebelling against God, against the will of God. And God through Joseph was calling them to repentance. Now, they're repenting. The Holy Spirit was working in their life, but the Holy Spirit was using Joseph you remember what Pharaoh said about Joseph? The man in whom the Holy Spirit is. Can you find anyone in Egypt? Anyone in whom is the Spirit of God? He was Joseph. That's why he, he chose him to become the prime minister of Egypt and manage the, the, the famine for him. The only reason was because Pharaoh saw the Spirit in Joseph, the Spirit of God in Joseph. And now this spirit is working through Joseph to bring his brothers to repentance. John 16, 8, and when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So, they admitted that they were guilty. And that brings us to my final point. Joseph's unconditional love to his brothers. Listen to verse 23. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Now, you need to remember that, you know, Joseph can still speak Hebrew to them. But he didn't want to reveal who he was. So he was pretending as if, he was an Egyptian who couldn't speak Hebrew, but he was listening to everything that, that they were saying. They were repenting. And because he was listening to their repentance, you see, he turned back and he wept. Compassion. That was the real Joseph, the real Jesus. When his children repent, when, when his brothers and sisters from his father, 
repents. He weeps. He shows compassion towards those who seek him. That's exactly what Joseph was doing. He wept. Some people, they say, but he was torturing them. He was treating them as strangers. He was calling them to repentance. And once they repented, then there was no alternative for Joseph than crying, than weeping. You see, this prefigures for us the unconditional love of Christ for his people. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. You know, sometimes we misunderstand John 3.16. God so loved the world, he gave his own begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But do you know John 3.16 comes after John 14 and 15. And in John 14 and 15, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about the experience of the Israelites in the wilderness. When they rebelled against God, God sent to them poisonous snakes. And they bite them. They killed thousands of Israelites. Then they repented. And God commanded Joseph to set a bronze serpent snake on the standard. And whoever was beaten by the snake, if that person looks to the bronze serpent, he leaves it. Remember that story? And then Jesus said in John 3, 16, in the same way, God loved the world when everyone in the world was rebelling against him. No one was repenting, and yet God loved the elect. God loved rebellious men and women like you and I. But he loved us while we were still sinners. The unconditional love of God becomes extraordinary when we remember that when God loved us, we were not repenting. We were his enemies. He's a God who turns enemies to friends. He calls his enemies, my children, who, who calls his enemies to his kingdom, to his church. That's unconditional love. Joseph had no option than loving his brothers. And I want to encourage all of you tonight. If you keep loving people, even those people who hate you, even those people who wronged you, if you keep loving them, if you just become like Joseph, and then even the greater Joseph, Jesus Christ, either God will crush their heart and they will repent and they will come to you and say sorry, or they will not be forgiven forever. And they will go to hell with their sin. Be like Joseph. Be like Christ. Be a man and a woman of compassion. And God will use you for his kingdom. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, at times when you bring the reality of your word, the truthfulness of your word before our eyes, we indeed see ourselves, our, our spiritual condition, our problem, our need to repent, our need to acknowledge our sin before you. And tonight we